Sorry about that. Um, anyway, when Mandela came out of Robben Island after 25 years of imprisonment, he came out as a peaceful, loving, kind, focused man. He wasn't consumed by hate. He did not let the circumstances decide what he was. Okay? His existence preceded his essence. He decided to be a kind, awake person to the middle of all this. He was the master of his fate. He was the captain of his soul. All right, another example to look at, very similar to that, is a guy named Victor, Victor Frankl. Frankl was somebody, uh, he, he was a Jewish doctor living in Vienna at the time that the Nazis took over Austria in 1938. And as a Jew, he was rounded up as for his family, his wife, and eventually he was sent to Auschwitz. And Frankel's entire family, except for one of his sisters, I believe, were all killed during the Holocaust. And Frankel lost an enormous amount of weight. He saw friends around him die. The guards were brutal. They were degrading. One of the things they would make them do was march out in the middle of winter and dig ditches for no apparent reason or try to make roads for no apparent reason. They would make fun of him because of his degrees. Um, there was a very, very scant amount of food to eat. People were committing suicide all around him. And yet, Frankel talks about a couple of very amazing examples. One of them is he talks about how, even in the midst of this cold, horrible winter morning where he's being dragged outside and made to work on this road in the middle of nowhere as these guards are screaming at him and he's being degraded and treated like an animal. He said he, he was still able to focus the thoughts of love on his wife. And he said, he said that, that love that he had for her couldn't be touched or diminished by anything going on outside of him. His inner freedom allowed him to focus on her and nothing could take that away. That was something that he had chosen and he had decided to be that loving toward his wife and no one else had any say in it. It was his and his alone and it, he was free to do that. So the circumstances didn't determine what he could do in that regard. Another example that shows that the circumstances could not determine what he did is when Frankel was talking about how he decided to use his degree, degree in psychiatry to help his fellow prisoners. So he would go and visit with them, he would listen to them, he would try to diagnose some of their problems, he would offer some advice. He wasn't getting paid, there wasn't any prestige surrounding it, no one was telling him to do it. He just decided this, in a sense, out of the goodness of his heart because he freely chose to do what he thought and was aware of being a good thing to do in the circumstance. So again, he took responsibility for acting in a kind and good manner, even in the midst of very horrendous circumstances. Like Mandela, Frankel said, look, the Nazis can take away all the external freedoms, but my inner freedom to think a certain way, to choose to be loving, to choose to be kind, to demonstrate small acts of kindness, nobody can take that away from me. That's mine and mine alone. So this is an example of this radical freedom and awareness in action in the lives of people where it seems like they have no freedom. Okay, that's how radical the freedom of the existentialists are getting. At. It's not limited by what's going on. It's not limited by where you live. It's not limited by your family. It's not limited by your genes. It's not limited by your job. I mean, the existentialists are getting at this idea of look. If someone says, "Look, my job sucks. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, I have to do the same boring routine every day." The existentialists would tell the person, "Look, stop." think about what kind of freedom you have. First of all, do you have the freedom to go to another job? 
Okay? Is that a possibility? Look into that. Secondly, well, you're at the job, you have the freedom to do certain things a little bit different. Do you have the freedom to be a little bit more creative in certain areas? Do you have the freedom to think different thoughts about your boss? You might think, oh, my boss is an idiot, but maybe you have the freedom to think, okay, what's going on in his life? Try to develop a more empathetic attitude toward him and think of him differently. No one is telling you, no one is forcing you to think a certain way. No one is forcing you to do exactly the same thing every day, even if the general demands of the job are the same. So I, I think about uh, the experience that I had working for Verizon Wireless, the first job I had after graduating from undergrad, where I didn't want to be at the job. Uh, at first, I really didn't like my boss. I found it kind of meaningless. I thought it was stupid. But then I began to realize that I had the opportunity every day to interact with my coworkers and with the customers in a kind and awake manner. I could choose to actually exercise some degree of humility, uh, humanity, civility, work for what was good with the customers, try to get to know the products well, develop my own uh, way of trying to sell the cell phones, make sure I looked out for the customer's best interest, made sure I treated them as human beings and not just as numbers for a quota. So in that regard, I still had freedom and I could take responsibility for my actions that I chose. I had the awareness to realize, okay, there are different ways of doing this. Every day is a new day in terms of how I can approach the situation. I'm the one who can choose what I want to do here. No one else is forcing me to do it. Now, I could have slipped into that kind of inauthentic mode of just doing as everybody else would do, is kind of putting on the blinders and going through the routine. And sometimes I did that. I fell into that. But there were also days where I was like, okay, I can choose how I live this day. This day is something that belongs to me. Uh, Henry David threw out this really great quote. He said, only that day dawns to which we are awake. And I think what he meant by that is when we're awake to the possibilities of the day, to the ways in which we can be kind, to be creative, to be responsive to the beauty we see around us, when we're really attuned to that, okay, that day becomes something that we can make our own, that we can really choose to live fully and to the best extent possible. And that can happen, according to Frankel, according to Mandel, that can happen even in the middle of really horrendous circumstances. You can still have a good, beautiful, wonderful day because you've chosen to live out your best qualities in an aware, responsible fashion, even in the midst of externally horrible things going on. So I think that's just this wonderful part about existentialism, this ability to go inside and say, I will direct the course of my day, the course of my week, the course of my life, and I will take free responsibility for this, following what I've become aware of as good, healthy, fulfilling options for my life. Final thing I want to talk about with this is Albert Camus, C-A-M-U-S, and the myth of Sisyphus. Okay. S-I-S-S-Y-P-H-U-S. -S the myth of Sisyphus. Now this is a Greek myth. And Sisyphus has been condemned by the gods because he disobeyed them. And he's been condemned to what some people might call a fate worse than death, okay? So he's been condemned to push up a rock, up a large hill, and then just as the rock gets to the top, it slides back down. And Sisyphus has to go pick up the rock and push it again. So Sisyphus has an eternal punishment. He's eternally condemned to do the same thing of pushing up a rock and then watching it slide back down. Pushing up a rock, how it should slide back down. 
So just as he's about to accomplish his goal, his goal, what he's working for, it slides back down. Now, Camus points out that, okay, this seems pretty meaningless, right? This seems pretty pointless, pretty absurd. What the heck is going on, okay? There doesn't seem to be anything that Sisyphus can do in this situation. He seems trapped in this pointless, meaningless, absurd type of existence. But this is the, uh, Camus makes, I think, a couple very interesting points here. First of all, the situation with Sisyphus, says Camus, is not really different from somebody who works at the same kind of job for 40 or 50 years, then retires and gets a gold watch. So this is actually fairly similar to something we saw yesterday with Marx. When um, when work becomes kind of rote, mindless, and meaningless, it might become similar to this situation with Sisyphus. You're just pushing up this rock. It doesn't really go anywhere and rolls back down. You keep doing this and just keep doing the same work over and over and over again. And it's not actually accomplishing anything. So. That's an interesting point, I think, to, sit, to think about in relation with Marx to existentialism. But the second point is also really fascinating. The second point is this. With Sisyphus, according to Camus, there comes a point at which he becomes aware of what he's doing. He realizes that each time he pushes the rock up, it's going to fall back down. And as he pushes the rock up and it falls back down, and he's at the top of the hill, and he turns around to make his descent, Camus says he might think about the fact that he's been condemned to do this by the God. And he could bemoan his situation, and he could complain about it, and he could say, I'm the victim and there's nothing I can do. Or, says Sartre, I mean, says Camus, I'm sorry. Or, says Camus, Sisyphus could then think about, you know what? I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to choose to do this. I'm going to be the one who pushes this rock up the hill. I'm going to make this happen. So Sisyphus, according to Camus, can actually take responsibility for this action, even though it seems absurd and pointless and meaningless. Camus says when he has this personal and deep exercise of his freedom and responsibility, he can actually create some sense of meaning for himself. And, says Camus, he can even be happy. So that, that's, that's the extent, the radical extent to the freedom that existentialism is talking about. That you can choose to make meaning and find some degree of happiness even in absurd circumstances, okay? Even in horrendous circumstances like Frankel and Mandela. That freedom to create meaning and purpose and happiness in one's life, the freedom to choose what kind of person we are, the freedom to rewrite our history in such a way that helps us live better now. That freedom is essential to us, is deep and essential to us, says existentialism. We have the capacity to choose what kind of, pe what kind of people we are. No one can take that away from us. Now when we fail to exercise that choice, and we become stuck in either a being in itself or a they self. We live in bad faith or we live inauthentically. But as Heidegger points out, then death might register with us and we realize, wait a minute, I have a limited amount of time. What do I want to do with my life? How do I want my life story to go? And we, we, we recapture the capacity to be to choose to be the author of our own lives, to choose what kind of existence we have. And then when we do that, even in the middle of horrible circumstances, we can find things of value, we can live in kindness, we can live well. 
All right, so a couple uh, thoughts to think about for existentialism. First of all, you know, how deep is our freedom, do you think? Are we really free in, in the radical way that they're, they're ascribing? Somebody who's raised in a really bad neighborhood, with drugs, with gangs, with violence, with no education, how free is that person to get out of that situation? Somebody who has chronic illness, do they have any freedom? Somebody who doesn't have a good home life and has never been modeled something like stability in his life, what kind of freedom does that person have? Are we free toward death? How much freedom do we have in regards to our own death? It seems like death is something that's just not chosen, just going to happen. But what kind of freedom can we have relative to our death? And what kind of freedom do we have every day, even in the middle of circumstances we think that are beyond our control? 